I am pleased now to introduce Nicole Collins, Student Senate President, Class of 2012. Each year, the Bristol Community College Student Senate honors one of many outstanding faculty members who affected students' education and their lives in a meaningful way. Nominations requiring detailed information about the educator's role are solicited from all potential graduating students. The selected faculty member is presented with the last lecture award. This year's recipient is William J. Kelly. It is my honor to present Dr. William Kelly. Good afternoon, class of 2012, and happy graduation. Now, I want to thank you for letting me play a part in your special day. Thanks especially to the student who nominated me and the Student Senate for selecting me. Believe me, I'm truly honored and humbled. After all, so many people at every level of the college are worthy of this honor. Faculty, classified staff, administrators, professional staff, groundskeepers, maintainers, campus officers, all of you who make this place run and run well. I want you all to know how lucky I feel to share this place with you and how much I enjoy working with you all. Now, when Kathy Burns, Director of Student Engagement, called to give me the news about my selection to present this year's last lecture, she said the nominating student felt that everyone, especially you graduates, would, and I quote, benefit from hearing his words of wisdom. Really? <laughs> I've been teaching for 37 years, the last 28 here at BCC, and I'm certainly flattered that anyone would still want to listen to what I have to say. But words of wisdom? I'm not sure I've ever considered myself a wisdom guy. Socrates, Buddha, Rousseau, Bill Kelly, See what I mean? It doesn't even sound right. So I can't guarantee wisdom. Advice, however, that I do have a little to share with you. But first, because this has been billed as my final lecture, which would make you all in attendance the last class that I will ever teach, I'd like to find out how effective I've been as an instructor. Therefore, I'm going to administer an exit examination. Now, it won't take long. This exam features only one question concerning one word, all of three letters long. Now, just like a game show host or a Vegas magician, I'm going to need a couple of lovely assistants to help me conduct the exam. President Sprager and Vice President Garrett, come on down. Here's how the exam will go. I'm going to dictate a sentence and ask you a question. Two possible answers to the question will be on cards, one held by President Sprager and the other by Vice President Garrett. And uh, just to interrupt now, these cards are gorgeous. Um, my friend and colleague, Professor uh, Marisa Millard, uh, donated the material and made the arrangements. And Allison Rice, one of our graduates uh, in uh, fine arts and graphic arts, prepared them. They're awesome. Now, you will indicate your choice by applause. So you need to be ready to make some noise. And that's everybody in the tent. Now, you all ready? All right. Now, here's the sentence, so listen carefully. BCC is holding its graduation today. Now, here's the question. Which it is the correct choice? Is it IT apostrophe S? Or is it ITS? Okay. Now, those of you who went with IT apostrophe S, how many of you would like to change your minds now? That would be a good choice. Thank you. Thank you. The correct answer is, of course, ITS. 
Now, if you made the wrong choice, you were probably just trying to follow the rule about using apostrophes to indicate possession. But apostrophes are also used to form contractions, as with IT apostrophe S, which is a contraction for it is or it has. In other words, ITS is an exception to a rule, a possessive form without the apostrophe. But here's the thing to keep in mind. Most people aren't particularly interested in why the two versions of the words are confused. They simply expect you to know the difference between them, and they expect you to use them correctly. Expectation. You'd better get used to it. It is going to be a constant in your life, especially now that you're a college graduate. Worse, you can expect employers or professors at senior institutions to occasionally have high expectations about your ability to deal with things that are new to you, things that are hard, things about which you might not feel confident. In general, things that seem beyond your current knowledge or abilities. So what are you going to do and how are you going to handle these kinds of situations? Here's the advice I promised. When you face an expectation that rattles or unnerves you, try this two-step strategy. First, figure out exactly what you are being asked to do, and then adjust your attitude. Open your thinking up to the possibility that you can fulfill the expectation. Now, in an interview that I read over 30 years ago, Steve Martin, wildly successful comedian, writer, actor, playwright, novelist, and musician, discussed this very subject. For a movie called Pennies from Heaven, he was expected to perform a number of elaborate dance numbers. The problem? Steve Martin had no background or experience as a dancer. So what did he do? Martin said that he imagined what a dancer does, how a dancer moves, and then tried to act that way. He still needed many hours of dance lessons. Imagining by itself is nothing more than daydreaming. But his approach helped him rise up to and then fulfill his director's expectations. In many ways, this strategy is exactly what you do when you write, as you know from your writing class. Writing is a messy, amorphous process, always hit or miss. And you revise and re-revise until you have a version that has the right combination of examples and details to meet your reader's expectations. Believe me, I know that following this strategy is no simple matter especially when the expectations awaiting you are frustrating or intimidating. About 14 years ago, I took up handball, a demanding sport with a ridiculously long learning curve, at least for me. On one particularly exasperating day, there I stood, feet flat on the floor, upper body bolt upright and rigid, like some deeply confused Irish step dancer. I asked Jack Doyle, one of a number of outstanding handball players who have helped me over the years, for some guidance. OK, Jack said patiently, react, relax a little and get into more of an athletic stance. And then he looked at me and said, matter of factly, you're an athlete, right? Ah, that's, that was an interesting question. I hesitated for a second myself, and then I thought, well, if you say so, I guess so. An athlete was what Jack Doyle expected, so that's what I tried to be. I crouched a bit and leaned forward, shifting my weight so that I was more on my toes, and I was ready to begin to learn. To begin. Don't count on instant gratification when it comes to complex expectations. Like writing, they are messy, hit or miss matters. In 2010, the Library of Congress identified MGM's The Wizard of Oz as the most watched movie in history. So odds are good that you've seen it. Towards the end of the film, Dorothy and her companions return to see the wizard after destroying the Wicked Witch and discover that he's a fraud, a humbug. Still, he agrees to do what he can to fulfill the promises he made to them. But the wizard quickly dismisses the scarecrow's request for brains. He calls brains a very mediocre commodity. What the scarecrow needs, the wizard says, is a diploma. And then, by virtue of the power invested in him, quickly confers a degree on the scarecrow. Now, how about that? The wizard is apparently just a college president on the run. Who knew? <laughs>
The Scarecrow's degree is in Thinkology, which I imagine must be a very difficult major. And even though his degree is merely honorary, the Scarecrow understands the expectations that come with it. It's time for him to be smart. And he immediately puts a finger to his temple and rattles off the Pythagorean theorem, which he gets wrong. <laughs> yep, he refers to an isosceles triangle, not a right triangle, and gives incorrect information about square roots relative to the sides of the triangle and the hypotenuse. Well, what did you expect? He's still a scarecrow. And in all fairness, his transcript doesn't indicate that he had ever even taken geometry. But that's not the point. The scarecrow recognized the expectation and then, immediately adjusting his attitude, gave his best effort. So he didn't immediately succeed. So what? It's all hit or miss, remember? He'll figure it out. He'll do better tomorrow. We all generally do. So as you walk across the stage today, embrace your inner scarecrow. And as you do, please concentrate on keeping its and its straight instead of worrying about the Pythagorean theorem. After 37 years of seeing these little words misused, I'm becoming a little discouraged. Thank you. Now enjoy the rest of this special day. You deserve it. You earned it. Thank you. 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 Professor Bill Kelly.